Alright, oh we live. Let me just straighten this up. How are we doing? Let me see. Right, I'm just gonna share this on momento, on momento. I don't know whether this is, let me just check on here, yeah, it looks reasonably clear on here, alright, just share this, right post, Right, where's that gun? I'm just sharing this. Okay, so, ahlam wa sahlam bikum. You know what, on this end, the way I'm seeing it, it looks a bit fuzzy. I don't know if that's making a difference or not, but... <laughs> Alright, 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 alright. And swagatam, swagatam, people, swagatam. So, I think when I uh, got this to go live today, it ac I it accidentally put on the Monday nights with Mufti. I was meant to just write uh, Q and A live for today. This is just a one-off. Uh, due to preoccupations, won't be able to do it tomorrow for this week. So I thought, why not get it out the way today? Huh? All right, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Ahlam wa sahlan, ahlam wa sahlan bikum, ameen, Carlos. Alright, que tal, que hubo? So much interruptions. Is it interrupting? I don't know, is it, I hope it's, it seems to be going smooth here. Yeah, I don't know if it's interrupting. What preoccupations? Ah, well... I could tell you, but then of course I'd have to kill you. <laughs> story of my life, people. Story of my life, huh? Preoccupations. <laughs> it's not clear. Right, is it not clear? Do you mean by that the... Do you mean by that the... Is this clear? It's a little blurred. Yeah, I don't know why that is. It's not making any sense. I could... I don't know, is that any better? Not... Is that still no good, people? Still not clear enough? Need some feedback? Not... It is clear. Okay, cool. It's clear. So what on earth am I getting all this wrong feedback for? It's still blurry. <laughs> Let me check on here. The iPad, I don't know, it seems. Uh, yeah, it does seem a bit blurry, doesn't it? Take it spec savers. I know I don't know what's going on here. I'm a bit uh, confused. Could have to go to get some. Seems I don't know. It's the 
can't seem to is it fine is it okay is it, can, i mean i can if it's blurry if it's coming out blurry i can't seem to tell here it seems okay but a lot of people are saying it's blurry i can go and get some i don't know like a wipe and bring it back and try it yeah mm. okay un momento un momento un momento people i'll just be right back okay Alright, alright. Look at that. Looks like my books were just doing the teaching whilst I'd gone. Right, so that's a. Hopefully, that will now deal with it. That's a. Come on, it's. Should have removed. I don't know. If not, just carry on however it is now. <sighs> right, so nevertheless, gonna have to just leave this one the way it is for today. All right, so how is it going, people? How is it going? All right, look, my hairstylist has given me certain instructions are you guys feeling it <laughs> it's like this is the <laughs> so i'm trying this out let's see <laughs> right so anyway people what is going down what is going down right talk to me people talk to me reply reply to sunni defense i will be responding to sunni defense a little later on right let's us get a few questions out the way then we'll come to our dear friends <laughs> right how are you biz style i yeah i'm good lila alhamd no idea what biz style is but it's all good it's all good so what are some of the questions the turkish elections right god knows what's going on with the turkish elections all right somebody's saying say all right all right people all right i know in the pakistan elections pakistan elections are coming up people for once pakistan has some hope it's almost dare i use the terms god forsaken land <laughs> but for once it's got some hope i hope and that is with imran khan hopefully be ithnillah he may become the prime minister of pakistan and i sure hope he does absolutely rooting for imran khan you know may allah grant him success <laughs> i mean right is qada salah a thing let's take some questions let's get this ball rolling people uh PTI all the way absolutely absolutely is qada salah a thing qada salah is interesting because it does exist um you see it clearly if you look in the quran there's no clear understanding of qada if you look in the sunnah you find that qada is taught for things clearly for things like if a person oversleeps or unintentionally forgets his prey he forgets about it however the question then arises what about those prayers which you've intentionally missed so you've not been forgetful you've not overslept you've just not prayed do you make them up as well and these kind of fall in between so some people said that no this is you know this is like uh, uh this is like kufr if you leave salah In the past some scholars felt that if you left your prayer <coughs> you become a kafir. <laughs> uh anyway, there were quite a few I mean there weren't that many but there were a few scholars that held that view. 
amongst them the Hanbali school. Now, the majority of the scholars felt that no, we're going to add this, like Qiyas, like an analogy onto forgetful prayers, and therefore you will make them up. I would say I agree with that. You make up your prayers unless they are excessive. If they are excessive, then you do not have an obligation to make them up. If you do make them up, that's amazing. But if you don't, then Tawbah is enough. You can repent to Allah and focus on the prayers at hand. So if I had five years of Salah to make up, <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, not that I do. <laughs> right, no, so, but if you had years of Salah to make up, uh, some scholars would say you still have to make them up. I find that kind of a, a, a very um, almost borderline absurd imposition. That how could you? Because Allah doesn't even ask the woman who is menstruating to make up her prayers, which is only, if you think about it, every month, how many are they going to be? Because that's deemed excessive. Fama baluka. What do you think about having. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of salah to make up. That's to me. I don't know why how people think that's possible, but if people do it, alhamdulillah. But I don't feel there's any obligation. Was autism case what was autism cases also in existence amongst the early Muslims? Any accounts of this nature? Gul Bahar. Gulbahar, I think that's a very good question. I think autism or special needs or these kind of things have always existed. I don't think they're a modern phenomenon per se. Um, but in the past, these things obviously weren't. I mean, it's only the very recent kind of past that we've started to identify and term and, and differentiate and recognize and acknowledge. I think in the past, definitely people were autistic. Um, I w would personally believe that many of these great scholars may have been autistic uh, in a kind of savant autistic way. So you get sometimes, um, it depends because autism is seen sometimes as people see it as like almost like a disability. And it doesn't have to be seen like that. Uh, it's... People usually on the autism spectrum will find social interactions difficult. So they won't register, like social cues and things like this won't register with them. So they don't necessarily understand people when they're not, when, like in, when we say things generally in, in language, we're not very direct. In fact, often we're not direct. Uh, you know, like people will say things like, uh, I don't know, like from basic things to, um, yeah, like, I don't know, like, let's say I'm going to, oh, would you like a cup of tea? Like people might say something like, I'm going to put the kettle on. Like they, they won't say, do you want some tea? Uh, or they might, like the way, like, let's say I'm going to ask somebody to do something. I might ask it in a way like, oh, you couldn't do this, could you? Oh, you couldn't. You couldn't pick that up from there, could you? Like this, it, it softens the imperative, the, the kind of command. It's softened by making it into a kind of hypothetical in saying, oh, you couldn't do this, could you? Uh, now, things like this, I'm not saying all of them, it's a spectrum, but different things like this and beyond social interactions and cues sometimes are difficult. They don't understand and they just, and they need everything to be ship-shaped and kind of, to fit in compartmentalized. Um, and so you see sometimes in the past, many of the scholars like that. But with autism, you also find savants sometimes, like you get a lot of professors in universities who are autistic. They may be maths professors or sometimes different types of professors. They're in incredibly intelligent, but they're autistic. And that happens a lot in universities and stuff like this. So. Uh, sometimes, yeah, things like eye contact and stuff like this. And may Allah make things easy. And it is a, I have to say, those people who uh, have members of family or that they, 
have loved ones or other people that are that go through some of these experiences it can be a, a great challenge sometimes for people around them so our thoughts and prayers uh, are always with these people i mean may allah grant them ease uh, but in the past i would feel maybe people like uh, I've said this in the past and people have made, maybe people, I felt maybe people like Imam Shafi'i and people like that had this kind of streak of autism to them. Uh, in just the way they saw things and their fiqhi rulings are all very, you know, uh, everything is impure when it's like this or when you're going to buy and sell, you have to say a khutbah, a sermon before you buy and sell. And, you know, very kind of uh, like almost detached from the real world. Like people in the real world wouldn't do things like, you know, like they wouldn't start saying a sermon before they're going to buy and sell or, uh, you know, you know, so this and things like uh, like Imam Shafi'i's madhab where Imam Shafi'i had this understanding that if a person, uh, anything that separates from a living organism becomes impure. So if a person's tooth uh, or uh, became like, let's say, fell out. Now he considers that impure, but let's say you, it fell out, but you held it back in and you held it long enough that it reconnected. Um, he actually, his fatwa is you have to knock that tooth out again because you're carrying impurity. And I find these kind of fatawa sometimes so detached from the real world. And so, so it makes me think that maybe there was some element of this the, um, be, you know this kind of streak of autism uh, in not in not relating to social cues but that doesn't take away from them being a genius in their own way a savant and having great memory and things like this but uh yeah so <laughs> before people go what the hell did he just say about imam shafi <laughs> right so <laughs> Yeah, so let's move on. What are the question? What questions are going on, people? What's going on? What's bothering? What's on your mind? Uh, are we reverts or converts? In my understanding, it's called converts. Revert is like a, a Muslim made-up word. <laughs> <laughs> revert, as far as I'm aware, uh, unless I'm wrong in this, that revert is not a noun in the English language. It's actually just a verb. And it comes from a negative connotation to revert into something. It's, it's not seen as a good thing. Generally, I mean, the actual English essence of the term revert uh, and, and you get words that are related with, obviously, <laughs> you can imagine what rhymes with vert. And, 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 but Muslims have started to use this as a noun, like I'm a revert. I don't think this is a noun. Um, I'm not aware of this being a noun. I know, uh, I think, was it Ustad Jamal Badawi was one of the first people to use this term. And when he used it, for some reason, Muslims just... It just stuck to it like like a magnet, <laughs> and they started using it like. Re, and they obviously, they turned it into a noun instead of saying revert, revert, and but it's actually in essence a verb, and it's actually a verb which has a negative. So if something reverted, it wasn't seen as in a positive sense. The essence of the word. I know you could use it in other ways, but that's how the essence of the word was. Uh, no, I don't mean, uh, Saima, if it's a noun like a name, but a noun, like convert is a noun. Uh, but to convert is a verb as well. But revert is not actually, I don't believe it's actually a noun. It's just a verb that Muslims have started to use as a, as a noun. And this is just Muslim speak. It's, and now non-Muslims have picked up on it because so many Muslims use it. I don't like it at all. I think fair, if a person is a convert, is a convert. I mean, and then he's just or she's just a Muslim, full stop. You know, I, I don't know. I think it's a good question. At what point does a person stop being a convert and they become just a Muslim? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you somebody who has a great uh, discussion on this, and that's Sheikh Adam Kelwick. And he actually has a poem in English on this whole revert thing and really kind of take it <laughs> he's ridiculing this whole thing in a nice way in a in a very light-hearted manner so you can check out his facebook page 
Uh, and if you're not following him, then you need to follow him as an awesome sheikh from the UK, Sheikh Adam Kelwick. Why did the Quran become a tertiary source in scholarship? That's really an, in, such a crucial question that the Quran has become a tertiary kind of background. It's just like the background wallpaper. Nobody really cares much about the Quran. I know they claim to care much about it, but they don't in essence really. Like Islam for Muslims is no longer, for Sunni Muslims, Islam happens to no longer be about the Quran. It's not Allah centric. It's not even Quran centric. It's not even Sunnah per se with a capital S centric. Islam, Sunni Islam has become, unfortunately, like, like kind of, if I can slightly, it may come across exaggerated, but it's kind of become like Bukhari centric. So this concept of Sahih al-Bukhari seems to have taken the center stage and Allah, his messenger, the Quran, the Sunnah, everything revolves around this myth. This kind of like, almost like a, what's taken like a godlike status, uh, this, this thing of Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari. Uh, and everything floats in its orbit around Sahih al-Bukhari. Everything has to be interpreted to fit Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, not the other way around. The Quran, if, it has a, if we have a problem, we'll interpret the verse. We'll reject the verse. We'll consider it abrogated. We'll put it in the background. If it's the honor of the Prophet, doesn't matter. We'll accept it as long as it's in Bukhari. This has become, unfortunately, the new cancer of modern uh, and recent. It's not just absolutely modern, but uh, I would say latter-day Islam. Latter-day Islam has, uh, has been kind of struck with this cancer may Allah grant us all shifa I mean and I, I want to speak a bit about that when I'm going to come to Sunni defense um, about this thing and and by the way it's not an issue with Imam Bukhari per se and I want to speak about that when I come to it okay it's more about this myth that people have created right in your opinion is there a new, is there a need for a new type of fiqh I absolutely believe that there is an, uh, I mean, it is so overdue that there is such a necessity to update fiqh. Such a necessity, honestly. Wallahi, we are way overdue with updating fiqh. Our fiqh is so out of sync with our age. So today, fiqh ought to be about things like like the wudu section, starting from basic things to cover the, the taps and cover things like this and these kind of rulings. They're still talking about rulings like you've got three buckets of water and one of them you're not sure and this, this, this and the rope that you're using to take out water. And nobody, I mean, generally a huge part of the world has significantly moved on from all of this. We are in the modern age, yet we're still, and, th and that is the least of the issues. Salah is you know it's it's got some issues that can be updated uh not the actual worship but issues with it uh and then you've got things like okay fasting some issues zakat is completely out of date zakat has no relevance with our modern world at all in fact if you read a book of zakat today that it will have something like let's say let's say for example it's got 10 pages 10 pages dedicated to zakat. It's going to have much more. Let's say, in essence, a book depends on the size of the book, but it's going to be a whole a sub book, a sub, a great chapter dedicated to zakat. Could be 10, 15 pages, whatever. It's going to be dedicated to zakat at least. Could be many more. In all of that, probably at most one page would be to do with actual gold and silver. Uh, and which, by the way, is so out of date. Nothing is to do with our day and age in dealing with uh, assets, in dealing with whether it's going to uh, money, currency, having different currency, having stocks, bearing uh, all of these. Kind, nothing, nothing. Uh, when you go through, OK, Hajj can have some issues updated, but stuff like food has very little relevance today. Uh, it's all about how to slaughter the animal and so on. And nobody 
very few people slaughter their actual their uh, slaughter animals themselves. Uh, then there's things like uh, uh, all these other transactions. The majority of fit books are all to do with these other transactions, which today don't exist. So it's things like, oh, when you're doing this with a piece of land or you're renting this. And it's not like rent like today. So it needs to be updated to today's kind of rent, how rent works. There should be a chapter on mortgages. There ought to be a chapter on things like student loans. There ought to be these are the kind of things. Uh, uh, these are the kind of things that ought to be in our fit books today. They ought to be things like when it's about food, that these small kind of, let's say, uh, additives, preservatives, sections on this, the ikhtilaf involved. And then you've got at the end the criminal justice system, which, oh my God, is so, if you open that by accident, I can open any one of these books, you will be traumatized. <laughs> it's like, okay, so he got struck and uh, is the bone, is the wound, um, what the ha is it like something that reveals the bone? Does it just cut into the meat? How much of the meat? And then you will also retaliate by cutting this much meat from that person and you will cut into the flesh and no, will you reach the bone? Oh, this is how you, they're going to be executed. This is that. What on earth is all of this on about? And people still publishing fiqh books today. This is everything. This is this is what it says in the end. In all of them, nothing today is it talking about contemporary punishments, contemporary code of justice. Uh, there's nothing, nothing, nothing at all. So, and and by the way, oh, if if they've killed accidental death, you can give a hundred camels. You can give. Uh, you can give. Uh, uh, a thousand, you know, what is it like? You can give a thousand gold pieces, you can give this, you can give that. Who the hell has gold pieces? <laughs> Who the hell carries gold? <laughs> Who the hell has camels? <laughs> a huge section in Salah is all talking, uh, sorry, in Zakat, is all talking about for this many camels, in five camels you give one sheep, and in this many camels you give this, and, and then the cow has to be of this age, and in this many cows, a camel of this age, and a camel of two years old camel is called this, and then a camel is called a bint laboon, and a bint machad, and a blah blah blah, and blah blah blah, and I don't even know why I know this stuff. <laughs> It's like, why do I, why do I know about these camels and when they call different things at different ages? Like, <laughs> what, who, who, why? <laughs> like, but this is what we've had to learn. And <laughs> so exactly, so it's completely out of sync. And I wish that the ulama, you know, there's all these projects and I've said this before. Uh, I was at, uh, a few years back, I was at uh, um, Sheikh Ahmed Taha Rayyan's house in Cairo. He's one of the leading and most senior Maliki scholars in the world. And a uh, legendary scholar. And so I was at his house and, and he was uh, hosting us there. And, um, you know, we were just having an excellent conversation. And, and he was telling me about he was involved in a recent project. I don't know if it's come to an end now. It possibly may have. But he it was a commentary on... Uh, it was on one of the... It was basically one of the commentaries on Mukhtasar Khalil. I believe it was... Uh, or it may have been either Sharh al-Kabir or Sharh al-Saghir. I can't remember now. It's been many years. But he was telling me that, look, there's actually... A, it's a group project that's been commissioned in one of the, the Gulf states. And every so often, every few months, he is flown out there amongst leading scholars of the world. I, I believe Sheikh Rugi was amongst them as well, who's a Don scholar from Morocco. Uh, once again, a leading Maliki scholar from, you know, from worldwide. So people like this of the, the highest caliber being flown in, and they do their own kind of personal research. They come back and basically they're going through this book, but putting the leels in there, evidences for the normal fit that is in the books. And this has been taking them so many years and they hope to have this complete and then published. But, you know, obviously, like I, that was amazing and everything. But when I went away and I was thinking about it later on and I thought to myself that, you know, in a way, it's such a shame that people are commissioning and paying all this money for all these projects. What they ought to do is ha bring these people in, but have an updated uh, a, a kind of 
in sync version of FIC produced. They ought to tell them, okay, we're going to work on this book this month. We're going to write a brand new kind of text and we're going to have issues that are relevant to us. Rather than saying, here's all the old rulings, just go find evidences for them. Like, we've got plenty of evidences. I don't see why. I mean, I just felt that it's a bit of, a, hmm, you know, like so much effort, but so wrongly placed in, in a way. Not wrongly, like it's an amazing thing. May Allah bless them and bless the effort. But it's so not the need, if you understand. Right, so let's take some other questions, people. Let's take some other questions. Right. So, uh, I have people posted some. Let me take a few questions. Because I did have a post today. Right, let's see. Assalamu alaikum. Mufti, can you answer my question regarding Hajar Aswad? This is Indra asking, not the Hindu god Indra. <laughs> <laughs> if the Hindu god Indra is asking me, <laughs> uh, I asked you, uh, what about Hajj al Aswad? Hajj al Aswad, the black stone which is in the Kaaba, we don't worship the Kaaba and we don't worship the black stone. And the black stone is not a stone from heaven. I hate to burst the bubble. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the myth amongst Muslims that the black stone was sent down from heaven and it's been absorbing the sins of mankind. It used to be white and then, then it turned black. <laughs> no racial undertones there. <laughs> but it turned black because, because it absorbed the sins of mankind. That's a load of nonsense, right? The black stone is just a stone which was there. That it has some relevance. It's a ritual. And the Prophet وسلم, he kissed the black stone. As an act of ritual, we kiss it. It has nothing special. Sayyidina Umar an said it very clearly. He said, Look, I know you're nothing but a stone. La tanfa wa la tadur. You know, you can't benefit, you can't harm. And if it wasn't for the fact that I saw the Prophet kiss you, I would never bother to kiss you. And so this is, that's all the black stone really is. It's not a, um, it's just a ritual. That's all it is. Right, so let's take a look at some of these questions. Right. Uh, what does this verse mean when it says to prevent it shaking under you? <laughs> what verse is that? <laughs> what, are, what are you talking about, Waqar? He has made mountains stand firm on the earth to prevent it shaking under you. And oh, right. Okay. Oh, as about mountains. Okay. I thought you were talking about um, the verse to do with Musa alayhi salam and the mountain Jabal Tur. Uh, Mount Sinai and I'll, I'll answer that as well since that's come to my mind but uh, this thing about mountains do they cause a do they kind of contribute to a, a form of stability of the globe I believe there is some some kind of po uh, some reality to things like that um, I mean you can these kind of things look you don't need religious scholars to teach you these kind of things you can look at what geologists say you can research google you don't need you know these kind of things we are we don't need to go to mulvis or uh, molanas or muftis necessarily and say you know is it true in geology this happens or is it true in physics this happens i mean these kind of things scientists and people who study the earth and nature and these kind of things, they are much more well versed in these kind of things. But I haven't, my understanding is that the mountains and things like this do con uh, contribute to the kind of stability of the formation uh, of the globe. But, uh, but I mean, you know, you can, you can research that further. I'm by no means uh, some kind of an expert on things like this. So I don't want to just speak out of my depth. <laughs> just in case I just act like I'm some kind of uh, expert. 
And then I have some guy refuting me saying, is Abu Layth a Dajjal or a Jahil? <laughs> That's good. that's awesome. Huh? Oh, let me come to that. Let me come back to that. Huh? Let me come back to that. Right. So the thing I was saying is uh, about Jabal Tur, Mount uh, Sinai. Uh, the she camel I've already answered before. The she camel. There was nothing. There's nothing in the Quran out of the ordinary about the she camel. Okay. That that is mentioned in the Quran. Uh, to do with Thamud. So the she camel of Saleh. So you can you can check what the Quran the Quran doesn't say any it just says that this camel is a sign and they are not to harm the camel and they choose to harm it. All the rest of this um, are all stories, all kind of like fairy tales that have been made up along the along the way. Nothing established uh, uncritically from the Quran or Sunnah. To do with, I mean, the Quran. There's no mention of anything out extraordinary, like as in when I say extraordinary, nothing uh, supernatural about this camel. It just says that there was this camel that was selected, and it was a sign for the people, and they chose to sacrifice it, and they are oh, sorry, kill it, and they weren't supposed to. That's all it says. Um, right, you've got uh, Anwar Ahlan Wasahlan, Munazza Ahlan Wasahlan, uh, Jishan, right. Those of you just tuning in, click like, click share people, right, get this out there. Right, to do with Mount Sinai, I'd like to say that, I, you see, I think Muslims in the past have once again been falsely misled by uh, leaning in on our Judeo-Christian uh, cousins, if we can say, yeah. By leaning in on their heritage. And they have got this wrong. Okay. So there's verses in the Quran about that. And that we raised the Mount Tur above you. Uh, and people always believe. So today there's this strong understanding that Mount Sinai where Moses took uh, the, the people is in the Sinai Peninsula. And that's actually not true. Um, I mean, when you look at it from an investigative perspective, uh, it was named the Sinai Peninsula much after. It was named the Sinai Peninsula after Jesus, let alone Moses. Way after Jesus, I believe it was like maybe the 3rd century uh, CE that it was named. Uh, but it was named way after, nothing to do with Moses and things like this. Obviously, I mean, the name gets it from there. But there's a, a monastery there called St. Catherine's Monastery, which is meant to have kind of been set up at this mount that they believed may have been Mount Sinai. Uh, and it was from amongst of a group of mounts, mountains. Now, from here, the peninsula became known as the Sinai Peninsula. So everybody just assumed that because it's called the Sinai Peninsula, that is where Mount Sinai is. And that is not true. Um, upon detailed investigation, you will see that you see when Musa alayhi salam goes to Midian, Midian, the, the, the people of Midian, the tribe of Midian and Shu'ib and marries into them. The Midian did not reside in what is the current day Sinai Peninsula. They resided in northwest Arabia. And you can check archaeological findings of the kind of Midianite pottery and stuff like this still found and unearthed even up until recently in the northwest Arabian Peninsula. Nothing of that nature to be found in the Sinai Peninsula. It was not. And Jabal al-Tur was actually a volcano. It was not a, um, you know, there's this understanding it was a regular mountain. It wasn't. It was a volcano. And most likely it was what is today called, I believe, Jabal Badr, uh, the mountain of the moon. And, and that is in northwest Saudi Arabia. And it is around there that the Midianites lived and the people of Shu'aib. And hence they say to Shu'aib, Asqit alayna kisafan min as sama that shower onto us from the heavens, these, these kind of balls of fire. And that is the punishment they get. It was because of the volcano that erupted. 
And even when, if you look at the biblical sources, which go into much more detail, the burning bush uh, was uh, was a result of vol volcan volcanic fumes that are kind of released, and hence it didn't completely consume uh, the bush. Although in the Islamic sources, there's just a slight reference to the to the bush, uh, as in he says in Anastu Naran, like I. You know, and let me go and to this fire. But if it was actually something on fire, you would never go to it. You would actually be frightened. And in in the actual biblical sources, like in Exodus and things like this, uh, in the Judaic sources, you will see that they actually write that the Lord led Moses during the day as a giant pillar of smoke and by night as a pillar of fire to Mount Sinai. Because you have to remember, these people had never seen a volcano before. And this also explains that uh, the, the detailed description of the mount of the tremors when they're on the mount. And it also adds a lot more explanation of when Allah says he raised the mountain above them, the mushroom kind of cloud that comes above it. Um, this is what mount sinai actually was it was a volcano it wasn't this kind of uh, that people feel that allah kind of raised a mountain and a mountain was flying around in the air because because why did they say this because they once again what did the prophet say he said you will end up following the jews and the christians so just because the early and today some detailed biblical scholars investigative scholars have have come to this same conclusion that they've been getting it wrong in fact there's a very interesting book a very detailed book. I've got it here, actually. I've been going through the Miracles of Exodus uh, by Colin Humphreys. And there's other research as well, where they go through great detail in showing how everything adds up so systematically and that, that people were mistaken in thinking it was a regular mountain. It was clearly a volcano that they were going to. And, and then there's a great detailed description and it also adds light to when Allah says that when Musa salam asks, let me see arini anzur ilayk, and Allah says, you cannot see me. Now this verse, falamma tajalla, when the, now this verse, what does this verse mean to manifest to, to the, when the Lord Ja'alahu Dakkan, the mountain kind of trembled and it, and it crumbled. Now people here believe that, oh, the mountain completely collapsed. It didn't. Nobody's saying the mountain completely collapsed. What does it crum What does that mean? That was the eruption. And Tajalla here was the manifestation through the power of the, uh, of the, mag the, the majesty of Allah at work in nature, not Allah actually manifesting to the mountain as people believed in the past, that Allah actually showed himself to the mountain. That's a silly, that's absurd. doesn't make any sense. Allah showed himself to a mountain. That doesn't make, but it was that to these people, you see like in, if you remember that in books like Exodus, when the Israelites are actually describing, they say, and the Lord, that the Lord appeared as a pillar of smoke guiding Moses during the day and a pillar of fire guiding him at night to Mount Sinai. That the Lord appeared as this. Obviously today we know that the Lord didn't appear as that. What they mean is people in the past used to see the laws, they used to see nature like wind, storms, these things. They would describe them as the Lord doing these things and different cultures would even divide different gods into them like the god of the wind and the god of this and the god of that so to them obviously to the israelites it was just one god but the god that lord the lord is appearing as this so falamma tajalla that the lord manifests in this mountain it crumbles it's the mountain erupting the volcano erupting and having that crumbling effect that Especially to a people who've never witnessed, if you'd never in your life seen a volcano and you now witness this, the, the kind of impact and awe striking effect it would have and the ground to shake and, and fire 
to come out and all of these things this experience in itself would be would be kind of like out of uh, literally an out of this world experience it would be so that's what um uh jabal tur actually is and it's not and what's interesting is in the the classical times like so before uh moses and these kind of the people that lived inhabited that northwest uh arabia they used to worship the moon god and seen actually me was one of the names dedicated to the moon god and hence jabal uh, that you've got tur sinin or or what they call the sinai from the this actually makes a lot more sense uh, and hence that volcano even today is called jabal badr it's called the the kind of mountain of the moon um uh, this this is some discussion into this i mean one could say it's maybe not conclusive but it's definitely far more convincing than the other kind of narrative that we that many muslims have borrowed from the jews and the christians who even their scholars today are correcting that it's in the sinai peninsula and actual mountains were floating around and all this kind of stuff so i hope that's of some help right people let's move on right so let's take a look at uh, we've had uh, some old dear friends of mine <laughs> all right people i'd like you to click like click share we're going to share some words on uh, the the sunni defense so people the sunni defense are back um <laughs> I say Sunni defense but really they I don't know what they've got to do with Sunni I mean maybe like Wahhabi defense <laughs> right so and not even maybe all Wahhabis but you know but these guys are back and one of them this guy uh, he's made a video exposed right and is Abu Layth a Dajjal or a Jahil Ah 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 like <laughs> look at the the false compassion that they're giving you a choice that's like you know we're giving you a choice man like are you the jahl or are you a jahil you know just <laughs> you got to love the compassion ay <laughs> oh, <I> love you <laughs> so these guys are back So this guy <laughs> I think his name is Farid Fariduddin <laughs> Baba Fariduddin Ganja Shakkar <laughs> Toba to Baba Fariduddin Ganja Shakkar is an amazing and awesome uh, uh a, like a saint figure from from India ancient India Pakistan like that Obviously nothing to do with uh, <laughs> this Fariduddin there's uh, what's that <laughs> What's that saying? Kaha Raja Boj, kaha Gangu Teli. <laughs> In fact, that's a better name. Baba Fariduddin Gangu Teli. <laughs> so Gangu Teli here has done a a refutation of me, right? And he's upset. And he's he, he's really upset that oh, Abu Layth because a hadith on equality in marriage doesn't sit well with him because there's this lack of equal ah uh, why don't you why don't we begin by you actually saying what the hadith is uh, my friend my friend please you know please this one please say this one you know this one the hadith ladies and gentlemen that he's referring to that he's talking about oh because it doesn't have equality <laughs> it's nothing to do with equality the hadith is to do with raping your wife <laughs> that's what the hadith is not a laughing matter the hadith is trying to justify right typical typical wahhabis idha batat al mar'a hajirat firashiha firash zawjiha that if a woman refuses to have sex with her husband the angels curse her the god god is ang- god almighty is angry that why hasn't he had sex like 
God is angry. <laughs> the, the, the heavens are, are, are aflame. That, how is it that he has not had sex? For I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance. Right, so this hadith, which in one of my previous sessions, and you can watch the whole segment, it's on YouTube, about religious blackmail is haram. Like I've said that marital rape is categorically haram, and that includes religious blackmail. So to say to somebody uh, that you have to have sex with me, otherwise God is going to be angry with you, is haram. You can't do this kind of stuff. You can't use God to, to, to gain favors or sexual favors from people. That's sick, right? So now, and the angels will curse and so on. And so I've been through this hadith in the past. I won't go through the whole thing. I went through the riwayat in Muslim, Abu Dawood, Bukhari, Darmi, Ahmed, and showed how they all centrally pretty much are based on al Amish who takes it from Abu Hazim, from Abu Huraira. And although I go into uh, the other riwayat as well, but because a lot of them centrally are based on Al-A'mash, uh, I, cr I show the criticism to do with Al-A'mash, Suleiman Al-A'mash. Now, <clears throat> our friend here, brother, you know, brother, this one, please, please, this one, you know, brother. <laughs> I think the brother is from Bahrain, you know, the brother. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that he's uh, not allowed to do the preaching in Bahrain, you know, this one. So now, oh, he's not allowed to do it because this, because all he does is just bash his Shia. And obviously, <laughs> I think he's a bit scared, you know, in Bahrain because the Shia, you know, they will then arrest him and then bash him back, you know, this one not nice, you know. <laughs> So he's not allowed to uh, preach in, in Bahrain. But anyway, he's managed to find time to dedicate it to me. Shukran, shukran, jasweelan, ya akhi, ya akhi. Shukran, wallahi, wallahi. <laughs> right, so Fariduddin, uh, uh, <laughs> Fariduddin Ganguteli, what he's done is he said, how dare Abu Layth, just because this hadith doesn't sit well with him. And it's because he feels this inequality. First of all, is nothing to do with inequality. This is to do with rape. Okay, so let's get the thing clear, right? It's nothing to do. We're not just talking about, and inequality would be a problem anyway, but this is much greater than that. So he says, how dare he criticize Al-A'mash? This is such a reliable narrator. This narrator, he has over 500 hadith, you know. 500 hadith in the Sahihain, in the Muslim and the Bukhari, you know, brother. So in the Muslim and the Bukhari. <laughs> oh, well, well, my friend, let me tell you this one. You know, we go to the, we go to the Kalam, we go to the Kalam. <laughs> this, this way. <laughs> Poraki, mi amigo, Poraki. Right, so we've got here, Al-A'mash. What had people said about Al-A'mash? Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak had said about him that إِنَّمَا أَفْسَدَ حَدِيثِ the أَهْلِ الْكُوفَةِ The people who destroyed the hadith of Ahl al-Kufa was Abu Ishaq and, and who? Who? Qon, Kien, Man. <laughs> Al-A'mash. A'mash destroyed the hadith of Ahl al-Kufa? Huh? Okay, but let's go on. Amash, my dear friends, was a great mudallis. What does mudallis mean? A mudallis is somebody who would omit names in the chain. So if I'm narrating, let's say I'm narrating something from, let's say from Omar, from Abdullah. Now, I realize that Omar, people, may be a, there may be a problem with him. Or some people may not like him. So there's different types of tadlis. But the one I want to get to that Al-A'mash used to do. Is he would drop this name altogether. This name of Umar that may be problematic. Let's say as an example. That people may say. oh, uh, And they may go straight to Abdullah. And this could be any person. I'm just using a random name. Now. Because he assumes that people know. I also took from Abdullah. So people will assume 
that this is a connected chain. But I've dropped a person in the middle. Now, what do people say about Tadlis? Now, Tadlis is of different categories. You've got, they usually branch it into three categories. The third category being the worst of its kind. And that is where the person you drop and omit is actually a weak narrator. So you've actually done this with malicious intent because, you see, if you did it benevolently, like let's say I just dropped a name just because, oh, I just said it like I wasn't fussed. But even if I mention the name, he's a sound narrator, so you've got no problem with him. That's of a lesser category because really I should be transparent and disclose everything. But where I drop the name and he's weak, there that's massively problematic because I'm misleading you. Okay, now in Tahdib al Kamal, it's mentioned that Al A'mash did Tadlis on more than 20 of his teachers. He did Tadlis. Tadlis an Akthar min Aisharina Sheikhan. Wa an Ahadihim, and from one of them, one of these particular 20, he did more than a hundred riwayat, a hundred narrations he did Tadlis. A hundred. So it's not, Tadlis is not just omitting somebody, dropping them from the name. But in this case, it's dropping problematic people and then connecting with another person, his sheikh, who I'm also connected with. So people assume I took it directly from him. So if you, if you see where I'm coming from right now, what does a dhahabi say? A dhahabi Al-Dhahabi says, Rubbama dallasa an da'if. That, mm, and at times he did tadlis from weak people, from da'if. What does Al-Ala'i say in Jami' al-Tahseel? And what does Ibn Abd al-Bar say in the Tamheed? They say, You dallisu an al-du'afa. He would do tadlis from weak narrators. He would hide them. And complete the chain. Tadlis from weak narrators. This is why Shu'aba, who was called Amirul Mu'minina fil Hadith, said Tadlis is haram. Haram. <laughs> wait, there, I gotta do this the pro proper, you know, the Pakistani Munazra style. Wait, there, the, wait there. <laughs> Not just you dalis wanid du'afa. You dalis wanid du'afa. He would do tadlis. So, ya ayyuhal mudallisun. So, Farid al mudallis. So, Sunni defense should be actually called tadlis defense. Right? So, trying to defend. So, they're so offended. How have I said that there's problems with al Amash? Look at this, the Ilal of Tirmidhi commentaries on this. Right. They mention Ali ibn al-Madini mentions that he has idhirab in some of his narrations. Uh, and they mention Laysa Bidak. Al-A'mash Yadarib. Al-A'mash, check this out. Haka ibn al-Bara fi kitab al-Ilal. في كتاب العلل عن علي بن المديني قال الأعمش كثير الوهم كثير الوهم ها قليل الوهم is he وهم is like where you, you, you make mistakes and uh, but not just mistakes like uh, blunders it's like blunders like that is it قليل الوهم is he you know he would have some kind of is it قليل الوهم لا كثير الوهم he would make mistakes in these kind of, he would miss, kind of like misrepresent them. In fi ahadithi ha'ula al-sigar, and then he gives examples of who. Okay, so kathir al-waham, yudallisu al dhafa So uh, Sunni defense, <laughs> my brother. This one big problem, you know this one big problem. <laughs> So Sunni defense was to say, oh, is Abu Layth then 
Yeah, you could say have illusions, but as in to make mistakes is the main thing, what they're trying to get at. Now, Sunni Defense is saying that there's over 500 narrations in Sahihain of Al-A'mash. Does that mean every single one of them is weak? I never said every single one of them has to be weak. Why? Because Hadith, what is the whole purpose of chain criticism? Something people constantly forget is chain criticism was really only invented so we could know whether the mutton, the actual content of the hadith was sound. Chain criticism was not a goal in itself. Chain criticism was only there so we know the teaching of the prophet was correct. So let's, first of all, we look at the chain, fine. Then we look at, all oh, right, ah, look at that. Gym in the morning, huh? <laughs> Cramping up now. So right now, the now we look at the content, the hadith content. Does it go against re the three principles? Does it go against reason? Does it go against the established sources like the Quran and, and the corroborated and the taught authentic sunnah, the authentic sunnah? Does it go against the principles of Islam? Maybe it complements them perfectly. Then we've got no problem with that hadith because it just complements teachings which are already there. No hay problemas, mi amigo. But if the teaching is telling you, oh, you can blackmail somebody into having sex with them, this one big problem, my friend. But then seriously, what do we expect from these people? These are the same people who in their last refutation against me, and I played the recording, if you watch my clip, and I believe it was him as well, this exact same person, saying that, so what if the prophet was sexually impotent? These were their words. I said, so what? It's in Bukhari, so what? You see, this is the kind of respect these people have to our deen, to Allah and his messenger. What do we expect from these kind of people? They will do anything to salvage Bukhari. Now, I've got nothing against Bukhari per se. You see, Imam Bukhari may have been a great person. His book was his private project. But what these people have turned Bukhari into is, is unacceptable. They've given it infallible status. They've said that every hadith, the hadith in Sahihain, they've said yufidul qata, which means are certain, certain. And that is utter nonsense. Let me elaborate, people. Now, first of all, Bukhari is nothing like... Uh, Papa ya baat kar rahe Oh no, I've been interrupted by the little devil. Chalo, salam bol lo. Aja. And you gotta go. Okay, take it. Assalamu alaikum. Take it. Ab chao, darwaza band kar do. Take it. Chao, 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 chao. Why are you cold? Acha, haan, baat nahi, baat nahi. Ab, wo band kar do, band kar do. Shabash. So, the thing is that, look, now, You've got to remember something. I'm going to mention some interesting points, right? And that is that Imam Bukhari's book today, what these people have turned it into, is not like other books of hadith. It's not like, for example, the Muatta of Imam Malik. Imam Malik, in his time, his Muatta was popular. You have to remember Imam Bukhari got blacklisted towards the end of his life. The last few years of Imam Bukhari's life, nobody took anything from him in hadith. He was, his, he was rejected, he was chucked out of every major city, and he just wandered through these and eventually just like a bit like a nomad and just died in an unknown town. He wasn't, he was not welcome because of the controversy that they, they said he, he believed the Quran was created. So they all blacklisted him. Nobody would take from Imam Bukhari. Imam Muslim hasn't included any hadith from Imam Bukhari in his book. Even though Imam Muslim stuck with Imam Bukhari almost till the end, but then he eventually boycotted him as well. But Imam Bukhari was not like, like people like Imam Malik, who in his day and age, right up until his death, everybody is coming, taking his book and doing things like this. Imam Bukhari in the last few years had went through a great ordeal. He was rejected. Nobody took any hadith from him. So the, we have a great problem. And that is... 
and this may come as a shock to some of these people, but do you know the Bukhari that we have in print today is nowhere near as certain as people like it to be, like to present it to be. And I will ask any of these people to show me with certainty how they know with certainty that this Bukhari we have today goes back to Imam Bukhari. Now, before, let me explain that. Right. First of all, Imam Bukhari people, all today's print that we have, there are only several key template manuscripts throughout the ages that existed that everybody copied from. So all of the Bukharis that you have in around today that are printed come from a particular manuscript, which is known as the Nuskha Sultania. The Nuskha Sultania, which is from Sultan Abdul Hamid from the Ottoman times, he had it commissioned. There are several problems even with the Nuskha Sultania, as in what did he actually, what did they base it upon? And then there were at least a hundred mistakes found in that that were edited in the Taba'at uh, Bulaq and then in Dar Ihya Turath. And this is the copy we have today. This is a patched up copy. Let me add to that a bit of flavor. Pause that for a moment. I'm, I'm giving you some, and, and I know these people will hopefully hear this and I'd love to hear their response. Imam Bukhari had several key students that transmitted from him. There's popularly about six. Let's take these six as a popular example. The eldest amongst them, the most senior amongst them, that is his transmitter, is Ibrahim ibn Ma'aqal al-Nasafi. All of these six that you have, and there may be more, but let's say these popular six kind of transmitters, right? These people, none of their narrations reach us except through one. And that is through Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Farabri. Farabri is the only person whose narration reaches us. The problem with Farabri, first of all, one problem, is that nobody in his contemporaries declared him to be authentic in hadith. Nobody. The only people declaring him to be okay are people like Zahabi almost three, four hundred years later. We, I... From his contemporary, he's a contemporary of Bukhari, he's younger than him, but he's contemporary. Where are the people saying he's a thiqa to start off with? Secondly, Farabri, by the way, he has about seven key people taking it from him or six key people taking it from him. All of them disagree in what they transmit from him. So they have not just different chapter headings, they have different names in chains, they have different chains, they have hadith missing, they have so many, all amongst themselves. One of Farabri's key students, his name is Abu Ishaq al-Mustamli. Al-Mustamli says that we used to sit by Farabri and he had a text which was a musawwada. Musawwada means it was incomplete. He says his book was incomplete and we used to copy, it had a lot of blanks in it and we the students used to fill it in. We used to move it around and make chapter headings and do things ourselves. Now, Qastalani, Abu Walid al-Baji, all these other people say that is actually true because their narrations are all moved about. The fact that the students of Farabri interfered in Bukhari, the book of Bukhari today, is a fact. This is undeniable. And, you know, they try to coat over this by saying, oh, it's just little differences like they changed the chapter headings. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Well, the scholars like uh, Ibn Abdul Hadi, the great Hanbali scholar, I'm sure they've heard of him. They love him. <laughs> These Hanbalis, right? So he has a book called Riwayat. That, uh, that the sorry اختلاف الروايات البخاري عن الفرابري that the اختلاف of the students of Farabri transmitting from him and you will read this you will see yes sometimes these chapter headings are different that's true sometimes sometimes names are different sometimes slight differences like here the name is abdullah there they've called him ubaidullah slight different but still a different name sometimes it's a completely different name completely different sometimes the names are completely dropped several occasions the hadith don't even exist in each other now there's only certain manuscripts that existed throughout the time that were template manuscripts 
None of Frobri's Frubri, actual manuscript doesn't reach us. Nothing like this does. Some of his, they say there's a small, uh, uh, a few pages from one of his students, Abu Zaid, which was actually, they, they claim, the oldest in Cambridge. It was published in the 1930s. We have today manuscripts of people who came after and they chose and they patched together and they disagreed. So hence, Ibn Hajar relies on a narration uh, by Abu Dhar al-Harawi, the template of Abu Dhar al-Harawi. The template of Abu Dhar al-Harawi is based on the three students of Rabri only. And it's patched together. So it's not one of them patches three together. And that is al-Mustamli, as and he also does al-Kushmehani. These three patches them together. Now that's a problem because they disagree amongst themselves. Now you will see some narrations, by the way, in our, narr there's an, uh, in our narration of Bukhari today, in uh, Kitab al-Ilm, I believe it is, there's a narration in which Imam Bukhari is there himself. So in the chain, it begins by saying, Muhammad, Haddathani Muhammad ibn Yusuf al-Farabri. Haddath, qala Haddathani Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. So what the hell is Bukhari doing in his own chain? And what the hell is Farabri doing in his own chain? It goes to show that the person writing this is much after them. Now, when you look in Ibn Hajar's commentary on this, oh, it isn't there. People say, oh, it's not in there, because Ibn Hajar didn't rely on this, what we've got today. He relied on a different Abu Dhar al-Harawi's text, which had 200 hadith missing from the ones we've got today. So my point is, people, and I know there is a Saudi project underway, I know that, uh, where they're trying to take one single riwayah. In fact, there's a Salafi scholar online saying that it's a debt on this ummah to still produce a authentic narration of Bukhari. And they, they've been working on it for years to bring it out through one transmission of Al-Hamawi, uh, through Yunini's Nuskha. Now, Yunini, by the way, who comes in like, a hundred, like he, he's in like in the 700 Hijri, He's commissioned and he sits with a grammarian Ibn Malik and they make corrections because most of the templates of Bukhari didn't even have dots. They didn't even have dots. So one of the key templates is a Sudafi who apart from being Sayyid al Khat was really terrible handwriting, illegible handwriting, never used to write dots. And this is three, this is like in the 500 Hijri, like so many hundred. So I'm asking you, the Bukhari you have today, how do you know with certainty? Like, we, okay, we can go with it. I'm not saying we can't go with it. We can go with it as in, let's take this with a pinch of salt. As long as it fits in with Islam, we'll take it. But where there's a problem, we need to be critical. Not make the Qur'an and the Prophet rotate around Bukhari because the copy of Bukhari you have today is actually a patched up copy. It's not even, it's not even a certain copy. It's an opinion, not a fact. So let's get that right. The copy you have of Bukhari today is an opinion, not a fact. And they say, you know what they say? They say, oh, but that's not a problem because we've got all these mustakhrajat that... Uh, uh, We've got all these mustakhrajat, that people who came after Bukhari, and what they did was they went through, uh, surpassed Imam Bukhari and went through his teachers. Where are these mustakhrajat in print? Where are they? Show me, which ones are you talking about? And how do we know that they weren't influenced with these copies? Because this is another issue. And people say, oh, but you know, you can look at Sahih Muslim, and you can look at other books and you can, as long as all the hadith in Sahih Bukhari are in the other books. But I ask you, how do you know whether they were influenced by this? Like, let me give you a good example, right? Now, people, bear with this. It's a bit complex, but I know this whole topic is a bit complex, but it's incredibly important. Look, right, you have a book of... Um, Right, you've got a book uh, of Al Khatib al Baghdadi, the Muddah al Awham. Now, in this, you will see. Uh, right, just one moment. Right, so what you see is basically these people who criticized Imam Bukhari. Right, now they criticized him, they were contemporary to him. 
So people, great scholars, like uh, you will have the great Razian. Right, sorry, I was just trying to open this. Uh, okay, now you had great scholars like the Razian who are... By the way, Abu Zur al-Razi was a greater scholar than Imam Bukhari. People generally accept that. Uh, now, Abu Hatim al-Razi was another great scholar of Hadith and they were contemporaries of Imam Bukhari. Now, uh, anyway... In this book, Muaddih al-Awham, uh, by Khatib al-Baghdadi, you have, in the beginning, he's critiquing certain scholars like Bukhari, so he shows a precedent. He says, look, I'm not the first person to do this. Uh, uh, people like the great Razis criticize Bukhari. But then he makes an interesting point. Now listen to this. He says, do you know the two Razis did a joint venture, a joint book refuting Imam Bukhari, with all the mistakes he made in the chain? He says, however, and this is like 150 years after Imam Bukhari almost. Uh, he says, but when I looked at my copy of Sahil Bukhari and I looked at their refutation, none of those mistakes were there. Like they were already all correct. So he says that, so I don't know, like maybe they had an old manuscript of Imam Bukhari, but they were contemporaries of his, uh, of him. You see, that's one way of looking at it. Or the other reality is by the time it's reached Khatib al-Baghdadi, it's been amended because a lot of people were fixing Sahih al-Bukhari. Like the students were doing a lot of, the students of Frabri were doing a lot of moving back and forth, changing names where, where it was suited. Now, that's the more likely outcome. Now, people say, yeah, but we can look at Sahih al-Bukhari and find the hadith in Sahih Muslim. And I would say, okay, let's take a hadith as an example. I want to give you a hadith as an example. There's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Prophet is allegedly saying, uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that a, a pious slave has two rewards. Right now, and then he goes on to say, so obviously if he's good to his Lord and he's good to his master, etc. Stuff like this. But then he goes on to say that, and if it wasn't for, listen to this. The Prophet it, saying, if it wasn't for being good to my mother, virtue of uh, help, you know, like being kind of like serving my mother, birru walidati, and doing hajj, and jihad fi sabilillah, if it wasn't for these three things, I would have loved to have died as a slave. Now that is nonsense. There's no way on earth the Prophet of God would want to be a slave. Nobody would want to be a slave. This is, this is utterly fabricated. Now, the interesting thing is, so some scholars didn't, like they just said, oh, maybe the Prophet said this out of uh, exaggeration or this or that or whatever out of virtue. Other scholars said, oh, there's Idraj. This part of the Hadith is not the words of the Prophet. This part of the Hadith is the words of Abu Huraira, radiallahu an. So hence you have, Hence you have in Sahih Muslim and in Musnad of Ahmad and these books, you have, uh, it says, Qala Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira said, right, Abu Huraira said that if it wasn't for uh, serving my mother and doing hajj and doing jihad fi sabilillah, I would have loved to have died as a slave. Now people say, Alhamdulillah, problem solved. Now this then is circulated in these books of hadith. It's found in Muslim, it's found in other books, it's found in this. And it's also, by the way, Imam Bukhari actually transmits that same narration with Abu Huraira in his Adab al-Mufrad, but not in his Sahih al-Bukhari. Now, upon later inspection again, people found problems once again with this. Now you ask me, what's the problem? So first of all, what is the problem with the Prophet saying this? Well, obviously the Prophet would never wish to be a slave. But secondly, the Prophet's mother was not alive. Why would the Prophet be saying if it wasn't for serving my mother? His mother was never alive, like, you know, during his adulthood. And if it wasn't for doing Hajj all the time, the Prophet did one Hajj and that was the final, uh, you know, the year. And then the Prophet passed away. Now, it doesn't make any sense. But then you look at Abu Huraira's lifetime. Now, although Abu Huraira radiallahu an was 
had a, the people say he had a good relationship with his mother and his mother embraced Islam, but there's no evidence of his mother coming to Medina. Even I looked up many of these sources and they all wrote the same thing that we have no evidence to show that she actually came with her son, came with Abu Huraira to Medina. There's no evidence. Now, another key thing is Abu Huraira never did jihad after the Prophet. That's not true. He didn't participate in the jihads. So we've got another problem. So this doesn't fit Abu Huraira either. Because him saying, oh, I'd love to die as a slave if it wasn't for these things that I love doing. But he doesn't do them. Because it's not proven that his mother lived with him in Medina and in these places. And he definitely, after the Prophet, didn't participate in the jihads. So what is... Then people say, oh, well, this must have been Ibn Shihab Zuhri in the chain. And it's from him. Which makes sense because Abu Ibn Shahab Zuhri had a very close bond with his mother. He did do a lot of Hajj and he also did a lot of Jihad. Now that makes, makes a lot of sense. But the issue now is, why did the people say in the chain, Qala Abu Huraira? Abu Huraira said this. That, this, that the, he said himself that these are his words. And where did that start getting bounced around? So we've got a problem. Because people at some point have started bouncing off each other. So it isn't as easy to say, well, Bukhari is always so sound because one, we've got Mustakhrajat. Well, which Mustakhrajat are you talking about? And how do you know they weren't influenced? And two, uh, we can corroborate it through these other books of Hadith because you don't know whether they bounced off each other. You don't know that because we definitely see some issues. Now, this does not mean to say, and I want to clarify something. This does not mean to say that is the is all had is hadith useless? Not at all. We take the hadith, ahl sunnah. We embrace the hadith to find the sunnah amongst it. But the sunnah is also transmitted in fiqh. The sunnah is transmitted in hadith as well, but the hadith has to be weighed for its content as well. You have to see if the content doesn't, as they said, lam yubayinil ma'qul, it doesn't go against reason, lam yukhalifil manqul, it doesn't clash with the established texts like the Quran and the established sunnah, walam yunaqidil usul, it doesn't uproot an Islamic principle. Then we can accept it. And then we've got no problem with it. But and even then we accept it knowing that there's a small, you know, it's we we act, we're going with it. We can't say a hundred percent, but it's enough to go by. Like it's enough to practice by, but a hundred percent we can't say this is the word of the prophet, but it's very strongly held to be the word of the prophet if it's corroborated with all these things. So People say, well, why are you making an issue out of these things? And I'm making an issue because today, look, people, what the Quran is over here and people have pushed it aside. They've pushed the Prophet aside and it's all about Bukhari. So let me give you an example, people. Let me give you an example. Did you know, like Bukhari will say something. So, for example, the Quran says, "La ikraha fi din." There is no compulsion in Islam in forcing people. Bukhari says, "If somebody leaves the faith, kill them." Move the Quran aside. The Quran says that the Prophet ka wa Those people said that the Prophet had magic done unto him. Bukhari says, "Prophet had magic done unto him." Push the Quran aside. The Quran says that إِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are upon the greatest of character. Let me tell you a hadith from Bukhari. Did you know in Kitab al-Talaq, people brace yourselves. There is a hadith in Kitab al-Talaq that the Prophet, this is what the hadith reads. The Prophet goes to a woman and says to her, gift yourself to me. Hibi nafsaki li. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. In Kitab al-Talaq, Hibi nafsaki li, give to yourself to me. And she says, Wa hal tahabul malikatu nafsaha lisafala? 
does a queen gift herself to low life people and then the prophet leaves and she says auzu billah mink i seek refuge in allah from you this is in sahih al bukhari wallahi this is in sahih al bukhari the quran says innaka la ala khuluqin azim push that aside sahih al bukhari the prophet saying to a woman give yourself to me oh sahih al bukhari the Quran says that you can follow the messenger of Allah, that he, he, his, his character, his strong resolve. Sahil Bukhari, oh, the Prophet became all weak. He became all, uh, they're, they're trying to interpret that he became impotent and stuff like this. They're trying to interpret that from, from there. The Quran says about Musa alayhi salam, وَكَانَ إِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَجِيهًا That he was honorable. He had great honor with Allah. Bukhari says, and Oh, and he ran around naked so they could see his testicles as an act from God because they thought he had swollen testicles. That's in Sahih Bukhari. That's in Sahih Muslim. That Moses, uh, he, because he used to bathe alone, uh, the Israelites said, oh, he's Adar. Adar is somebody with swollen testicles. And that's why, so when M M Moses came out, it was a miracle that God made the rock run away with his clothes. So Moses ran, ran naked after the rock chasing the rock and 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 the israelites looked at his testicles and said oh actually his testicles are okay he's not other the quran says he was wajih he was honorable and bukhari has this hadith and they oh the quran doesn't matter where is your honor for allah for his messengers is this how we treat them this kind of garbage that saying stuff like this, saying stuff like, oh, running around with swollen, whether he's got swollen testicles, oh, the prophet saying to a woman, give yourself to me, and she's calling him like a low lowlife, uh, and she's supposed to be a sahabiya. Where, what is this nonsense? So, I, of course, I have a goddamn problem with some of these narrations that are being transmitted, right? So, we have to examine this stuff. The honor Allah and his messenger come before everything. Our loyalty always lies with Allah and his messenger. Never with these kind of, oh, just because it's in a book, which by the way, is only transmitted through Frabri, which by the way, we don't even know how reliable it was. And even the Nuskha today we have is problematic. But put that aside, just because it's attributed to Imam Bukhari, we're going to compromise the honor of Allah and his messenger. Never, ever, that... Anybody who's teaching, this is the kind of, this is where we lose our deen. This is why Imam Malik, this is why I'm telling you people, Imam Malik, his motta was so different. His motta, he was one of the earliest compilations of hadith. In his time, it was popular. And he also in there says, I put hadith in here, which we don't act by. So he's taught you, look, there's hadith in here, I put them here so you know I wasn't ignorant of them. I'm not saying you should act by them. That is a legend. And this is why Imam Malik said that, you know, this one-on-one -on -one narration, he said, like, it will snatch the deen right from in front of you. So, and wallahi, that is happening today. So today we have this screwed up kind of messed up understanding of Islam. We're bending over backwards, acrobats, compromising our principles, compromising Islam, trying to justify marital rape in the name of Islam, trying to say it's okay to blackmail women to have sex with you just because, oh, it's okay because there's, there's a hadith I found in Bukhari, which, by the way, has a problematic chain. Somebody who's, a, who's got huge issues of tadlis, right? He's in the tabqa to thalitha, the third uh, tabqa, according to Ibn Hajar in his nukat, right? So... This, this is what, what the, our state has come to. So I'm sorry to kind of go on <laughs> about these things, but they are very kind of serious. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all tawfiq. Give us all tawfiq. I mean, but I hate to kind of break some of these, uh, <laughs> drop some of these kind of H-bombs on you, man. These kind of, it's like a, a Hiroshima kind of thing going on. But it's got to be done. We've got to get rid of this infallibility status of Bukhari because it's not true. It's not infallible. 
And, and I will, by the way, and there's several scholars who have written books on this. You know, there's a scholar, it's interesting, there's a scholar, uh, Ahmed Saeed Al Multani in Pakistan, who's written a book called uh, Bukhari, uh, Quran Muqaddas or Bukhari Muhaddas. And he was imprisoned for it. And he's, he's a scholar, he's not like a Munkir al Hadith. He's a, a scholar initially of the kind of Diobandi tradition, gone into, into this. And, and, and he said that Bukhari. What on earth is this nonsense in Bukhari? And he picked up some of these narrations I've mentioned and they sent him to prison for it. There was a book written last year in Morocco by a scholar called Sahil Bukhari Nihayat Ustura, that Sahil Bukhari, the end of a fairy tale. And he brought all these issues with the transcripts and the going through Frabri and the manuscripts. And, and you know, they, 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 they got a local court, the Salafis said to burn the book. And they got a, a judicial ruling banning the book in Morocco. I mean, this is what the age we're in, burn books. I mean, this is what we've kind of got to. But yeah, so uh, cool people. I just wanted to share some of that. You know, I'll do some rapid round and then I've got to call it a, call it a night, people. <laughs> I've got to call it a, a night. All I've got to say about that is that in the words of the poet, okay, where he speaks about having put forward his words and expressed them uh, to the best in, of the manner that he could. Ab jiske ji me ay isse le roshani that whosoever wants, let them take light from this. Hamne to dil jalakar saream raktiya that we've set our heart aflame and just put it there for people. Right, so, th thank you, my dear. Okay, so now, and the, and that exactly, and the, and the hadith of the underage is nonsense. That, chalo, uh, <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. Right, so, right, people. Any uh, any key kind of questions? Right, okay. What what does it mean by Imam Malik have an aura? What have an aura? I'm not sure what that means. What does that mean? Somebody saying I like the new look. All right, look, you like it? I thought my stylist has told me to improvise. What <laughs> wait the Navaya Sonia? Right, assist me with my shahada. Okay, inshallah. Of course, by all means, say, Ashhadu, Ashhadu, Allah, Ilaha, Illallah, Wa Ashhadu, Anna, Muhammadan, Abduhu, Wa Rasulu. And that you testify here live that there are none worthy of worship except God alone. Allah is just the Arabic word for God. God alone. And that Muhammad was his messenger and servant sent with the final message to mankind. Wa ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum to this, this amazing family of 1.5 billion people, is it? So it's I don't know if that was, but if that's of any help, ahlan wa sahlan bikum, ahlan wa sahlan. Right, it's amazing. I think we really need to have a, a message of, of hope. I want to say, look, last week, some people did reach out to me who are, are, are very dear to me in that sense. And, and they did highlight, I spoke, I was asked about the Shia community. And, and I said that, look, we don't do takfir. And some people did reach out to me saying, look, you but we have first hand experienced Shia saying certain things and all these things and first hand kind of heard this and and I don't deny that and I have spoken to some Shia as well. Uh, although just generally my it's not not out of discrimination but just I've not generally grown up most of the people I've always grown up with if they were Muslim they were always just Sunni. Uh but I have spoken to some Shia and it is true, look there are certain people who do do certain things amongst them and they do do these things and I do accept that to be true and I don't condone that kind of behavior I don't condone disrespecting the wives of the prophet I don't calling them prostitutes things like I don't condone that and I don't condone any of 
that, that kind of abuse to any of the Sahaba. I don't condone that. However, I do accept that, look, the Shia also of many kinds, just as, uh, just as the kind of Sunnis are. Like, you know, if you're going to speak to a Salafi, he, he, or some Salafi, not all Salafis, but you might get, they don't even have to be Salafi. Some people, they're hateful. They believe all kafir really are just filth and impure and most people are all deviants and they're all going to go to hell. And But that's not all Sunni Muslims are not like that. And and But you will get Muslims there saying that we live in Dar al-Harb and in the war zones. and But not all Sunni Muslims are like that. And I think, look, the Shia as well, I think, look, not all Shia are like that. And... There have been many of their scholars who have said it's haram to insult and to swear at Aisha, to swear at this. And I believe even Khomeini said that, I believe. And Sistani and all these other people. And and look, what I'm saying is there has to be a message of hope. Look, if, if, if all we're going to ever do is keep fighting with each other, then where will this get to? You know, there's a, there's a nice Urdu poem where he says, Is tarha saat nibhana hai dushwar sa. Tu bhi talwar sa, me bhi talwar sa. You know, this, that it's never going to work out like this. That, you know, for us to get by like this, that you, you be a sword and I be a sword. Like we're both, it's never going to work. You know, tu bhi talwar sa, me bhi talwar sa. You know, this is, uh, and it's got an awesome <laughs> killer ending to that <laughs> poem where he says, Me farishton ke sohbat ke laik nahi. That I'm not, uh, that I don't deserve uh, being in the company of angels. Ham safar koi chahiye gunahgarsa. That I need a companion who's sinful. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. <laughs> Cheers to that. So, but my point is, there needs to be a message of hope. So, if any. Sunni Shia people are watching this or whoever's watching this. I think, look, let's try, let, let there be bridges of hope. Okay. And I know people will have their own personal opinions, but as long as we're not agitating each other, you know, like in their own spaces, people may have opinions, but I think we need to kind of have some hope with the future, inshallah. Uh, is it possible that the devil is a metaphor? I, it's, I mean, possible to mean, uh, when you say metaphor as in the, the negative and uh, kind of an evil inclinations people can have. Yeah, I, I believe that could be an interpretation. Uh, although most people go with some kind of reality to it, but that could still be a reality. That could be saying that they that is still the devil as in a force, because the Hadith says it runs in your blood, meaning it's, within you uh, that could be an interpretation although that's not the common how most people understand it but uh, I mean look I don't think these things are at the end of the day that you know to me it's just like well you know if that if something makes some life easier for people I, I was reading something about some ex-Muslims and I was shocked to see that many of the challenges they had before they left Islam so, subhanAllah were things we've already answered on this and and it, it kind of upset me to realize that they struggled so much to find answers like demonic possessions magic the night journey miracles evil eye you know these kind of things and they were so shunned that eventually they just left the faith uh, where to learn Maliki Fiqh from? I have got some audio courses on YouTube. I've got the Ashmawiyah in six courses. I've got the Foundations of Islam by Qadi Yad in 21 lectures. It's on YouTube. You can check it out. I've got the History of Al-Andalus as well on there. That's in, I think, 12, 13 lectures. Uh, do check it out. Do subscribe to my YouTube channel, people. I've got a... <laughs> always sounds kind of cool now, isn't it? Subscribe to my YouTube channel. <laughs> right, so... Uh, but yeah, I, I try to put these short clips on there. Uh, why do why do the du'a for the bathroom say more or less to the effect where it says protect me from the shaitan? Uh, you see, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khubthi wal-khaba'ith. It doesn't actually say, save me from the shaitan. 
It says from Khubth, uh, which is kind of like, it's, it's more to do with foulness and impurities. But some people interpret this to khaba'if to mean shayateen. But the word itself is the plural of kind of like filth or foulness or... I mean, some people said it could be at the time this dua was used for many things. Like it could be, at the very least, it's a ritual. And rituals help people sometimes. Because a lot of people in the world, they believe it or not, but they have a strong inclination and a need for rituals. But some people said in the past it could be referring to other harmful things like snakes. And you got to remember, when this happened, people never used to have bathrooms. They used to kind of go out in the open. Um... And you can say the dua inside the bathroom, by the way. It's not, a, you know, there's this thing that you got to say it before you get into the bathroom. <laughs> they never used to have bathrooms then. <laughs> Hence, Imam Malik's mother was very clear with that. Uh, stoning, I've answered this before. That in, if you watch my video on YouTube on trajectory hermeneutics, uh, great scholars of the Maliki Madhab have addressed that. First of all, I don't believe that uh, stoning was part of this Sharia, it was part of the Jewish thing, which was condoned for a while, then abrogated. Uh, but all the rulings that were there, like the cutting of the hand and all this, I've explained how great scholars like Abul Qasim al Burzuli, it's on trajectory hermeneutics and uh, it's on uh, uh, how Hudud change with the day and age, if you YouTube that. Uh, and he, about 600 years ago, issued the fatwa that all these would change in his day and age. And he actually substituted them with finan financial uh, monetary punishments. And we would change them with th in this day and age with other things like prison and stuff like this. No idea about football. I don't really watch football. So, all right, people, with that, I'm going to call it a wrap. Uh, entering bathroom dua. Uh, Maliki School just says that you can say it, but you can say it inside death by firing squad. you got to be joking. Uh, until when can a mother nurse her child? Uh, a mother, I mean, technically they, she can nurse her child up until, you know, whenever she feels comfortable. Now in the Quran it mentions uh, that two complete years. Now is this being mentioned prescriptively or descriptively is a debate that is Allah mandating this or is he saying this because this is the general custom? Um, generally, that is the usual custom that people up until about two, maybe two and a half, they kind of, and then they start to kind of wean them off uh, uh, breastfeeding and stuff like that. But that, that's fine. I mean, that kind of, that's what's mentioned in the Quran. Um, I would just say it's kind of just recognizing it as guidelines and just highlighting the bond that is created. Uh, right. Imran Khan, love you. Yaar. Love you too, yeah. <laughs> Gio, Gio. Uh, right, so should, how long are you allowed to be on Snapchat? You can be on there as long as you like, man, as long as you like. Keep from shaving this. How long can I keep from shaving the Satar, Satar's area? <laughs> Who is this Satar whose area you're shaving? <laughs> Poor old Satar's like, <laughs> uh oh, he's gonna shave my area again. <laughs> Everybody's shaving Satar's area. <laughs> Poor old Abdul Satar. <laughs> I think what you meant to say was like the Satar. <laughs> Is that what you meant to say? Well, look, just shave it when it, um, <laughs> These kind of things you don't need to be kind of pedantic in. Just be normal and natural. And I don't know, people probably do it weekly or something like that. Cool. I hope that's of some help. Or oh, I could kind of get di diagrams and pictures. <laughs> you know, when we're in a club, we were in a class once, and this, the, you know, these people in madrasa they keep asking like pedantic OCD questions. So somebody asked the ustad about shaving his kind of private area. So the ustad said, "Yeah, it's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course." So he asked, "How much do I shave? Like, how much of the circumference around the area?" <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, people got OCD. There was a guy who was shaving up to his knees. <laughs> we were thinking, huh? <laughs> but the funny thing is, they kept asking this Ustad. <laughs> <and the> ustad 
the Ustad goes, he goes, get hold of your, <laughs> your, <laughs> your magic, <laughs> your royal part and kind of stretch it and turn it in a circumference and the whole area that it encircles, just shave that. <laughs> We, I couldn't start laughing. I was like, what the hell did you just come, come with that ruling from? But God is hilarious. It's hilarious. All right, people. Inshallah. Leave you to it. What is the on about? God knows. Even that's what, you know, as Ghalib said, the famous poet. He said, Kuch na samje khuda kare koi. He said, what nonsense am I uttering in this kind of state of insanity? By the will of Allah, nobody will understand me. So, inshallah, people, with that, I'm going to leave you to it. Sid, awesome having you in the house. Take care, people. Like, subscribe, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Snap, Mount 2014. That's it, people. Just keep it rocking. That's what I'm talking about. Have an awesome time till next week inshallah i'll catch you not this monday the monday after take very good care of yourselves inshallah stay blessed people stay blessed man inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh